Perfect. So yeah, hello everyone. I'm Rahel from XR Bootcamp and uh, yeah, super excited to see everyone here. And uh, yeah, and please, please share where you're, where you're joining in from. So for some of you, I would say good morning now. And for some of you, it's um, good evening or even good night. And uh, yeah, I mean, you are already probably knowing our open lecture series because you're here. And if not, welcome to this um, amazing series. Like we put some visuals here on that slide. So you can basically see um, we have always amazing speakers and um, we are very proud of that. Uh, to make uh, actually like this knowledge, this great knowledge more accessible. And uh, so, yeah, I, I would invite you all to follow us on exabootcamp.eventbrite.com. You will get the event notifications there. Or also, um, I mean, we, we just actually published this new event um, we are hosting on March 4th, which is um, Unleash the Power of Unity Dots. Um, and uh, and yes, yeah, so, so if you're if you're curious about learning more about the Unity CS dot system, um, I would I would invite you all to to join us there on March March 4th, which with um, with um, Roger King from Holonautic. He's also one of the creator um, creators of the Hand Physics Lab, by the way. So um, yeah, I would also, um, I mean, we, we also just like, uh, we, we had a, um, we are already having this creators, extra creators discord for a while. And um, it's, it's growing very strongly at the moment. And that's why we would also like to in, um, extend the invite to this um, discord channel now and hope that, um, yeah, I hope someone can can post the link in the chat or I, I will do that just after after speaking for five minutes. Um, yeah, I would like to invite you all to join us. We are really helping each other um, developing VIA applications, um, sharing sharing our network and expertise among each other. Um, yeah, so so in terms of Excel Bootcamp, um, we are really um, we will launch beginner level classes soon. Right now we are focused on really advanced level classes and um, yeah, all our students are always super happy with what they're learning. So even um, advanced people, they're still learning lots of new things in our classes. Um, it's, it's really challenging and we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentorship um, so that you can actually um, really learn and execute um, theory. Um, I mean, the theories that you learn from the lectures and then we will be really focusing on getting you um, portfolio projects so that you really, really can create impressive, impressive things in these classes. And um, yeah, so so we are proud that already lots of um, different companies are, are part of our courses and are taking our courses regularly. So um, you will also build a great network when being part of the EXA Bootcamp Masterclasses. So um, yeah, Ferhan, uh, my co-founder, uh, do you want to say a few more things about our concrete uh, course offerings? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rahel. Uh, always, it has been a pleasure to have these open lectures because this is the moment that we can see how much the knowledge being shared here is impacting the uh, developers, designers all around the world. Uh, we have a really great audience. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Rahel mentioned, actually we have uh, these um, different classes, maybe in the previous slide, I can share first uh, the, the uh, so yeah, so we have these beginner classes, advanced class and specialized beginner classes for subject matter experts. So I will, uh, today uh, we will, since we are talking a little bit like specialized topic today, advanced topic today. So I want to a little bit go through the advanced master classes. So um, what we are trying to achieve with advanced classes is uh, supporting you, especially if you are building an application for standalone VR or AR uh, platforms. Uh, like uh, Quest, Pico, HoloLens, uh, Vive, uh, any standalone device, because standalone cuts the cord, brings a lot of opportunities, but it comes with also some uh, challenges. And we, we at, based on the feedback that we have received from uh, our network, we know these challenges and we are actually tapping into all these challenges one by one with each masterclass. One of them is lifelike interactions using the power of different input techniques, uh, which actually locomotion uh, is also um, like uh, one part of it, of course, and uh, smooth running visuals, especially since you are working on a limited hardware, uh, optimization is the most critical part maybe. And the third one is creating a performant uh, code base, code infrastructure. So based on these three main pillars, we are actually creating different master classes. 
One of them is advanced VR interactions. Uh, the other is uh, rendering optimization, dots, ECS, and shaders. Uh, most of them are being launched uh, in the upcoming months. And advanced VR interactions is being delivered by Roger and Dennis. You probably know them. Um, and it includes holographic UI, immersed kinematics, um, physics-based interactions, hand tracking, locomotion, and many other many other uh, topics. So at the end of the uh, class, you are creating a, a virtual robotic arm uh, after eight weeks, and it is pure, fully de designed for even uh, like full time. If you have a full time job, you can still follow this class in a self based format or in a live format. And we are announcing the uh, today. Actually, we announced the rendering optimization class, which is also um, quite interesting. You are learning many techniques, profiling, uh, lighting, and uh, like especially rendering pipeline, how to port to a standalone headset. And the last two weeks of this class comes with a, uh, we call it nightmare scenario, that you have to uh, find a way to make the uh, experience running on one FPS to increase the frames per second based on the techniques that you learned to a level of 72 frames per second. So um, this is also quite exciting for us that we would like to see a lot of um, uh, different perspectives and methods here being implemented uh, by the students. And DOTS ECS, this is a new paradigm. Uh, ECS, maybe you already know, DOTS is uh, quite new uh, for Unity developers and Unity itself. We are actually um, creating a class that will help you if, especially if you have a scene with uh, hundreds of different entities, and if you want a performant code, this is uh, something that you can actually um, benefit from. And especially there are some companies or AAA studios um, that we, uh, we are now uh, talking about DOTS and ECS on how to bring their open world to a standalone or with a limited hardware. So I think we believe that these dots will be the future. So we will create actually a, a webinar and the announcements uh, will be shared with you as well. And shaders programming, this is uh, of course like, especially if you are already a Unity developer or Arnold developer, you already and uh, maybe use some shader uh, tools, but here we also want to teach you how to write shader, uh, shaders by yourself from scratch um, and how to create a performant uh, shader in a, for a standalone device without, without overloading the device, without overheating the device in a performant way, uh, which looks alive, which looks uh, as if you are running on a PC. So this is the uh, class actually focus. We will share more details about shaders class since we have already a few more months before that. So um, next slide, uh, we can share a little bit about how does our master class um, experience look like. I will not so go so much details, but we have live sessions for those who doesn't have time to um, follow the live sessions that you can always have self-paced format. We have amazing instructors like our open uh, guest lecturers and our masterclass uh, instructors. One-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, mentorships, uh, group-based mentorships is very important for us. And uh, every time, like actually a few, uh, a few uh, hours ago, I think one hour ago, we had the, the, another live session uh, so every week we are coming together and meeting and sharing our knowledge based on the recent improvements. And then you are also um, having a much better spatial computing mindset. Uh, so peer-to-peer -peer knowledge is very important for these advanced classes. Everyone is learning from each other. And as I mentioned, all our master classes built on an industry-based project. So you are actually learning by doing. Uh, so in the next uh, slide, yeah, we have a special um, discount for uh, for the next following uh, few days. So if you are interested on one of these classes, please let us know or share, uh, like join, um, inquire our curriculum and uh, apply. So we can also talk further based on your 
needs for your career, for your project. And the next slide. Yes, today we announce another thing, which is maybe uh, interesting for, again, standalone headset developers. Uh, the optimization part is uh, quite challenging sometimes. So uh, Ruben, uh, the, namely Game Dev Guru, is, is uh, very well known in terms of optimization on Unity. So we created a VR AR focus optimization checklist. So you can, before releasing your game, your client project, you can utilize this checklist one by one and make sure that you apply uh, relevant techniques or tools to your project. Um, because we know that how um, a client uh, dissatisfaction might lead uh, uh, really problems for the for the future of in VR AR industry and for for your own business goals. So we want to make sure that we are supporting you in that manner. In addition to the of course master class. So as a last note, yeah, we today we are with uh, Mar Gonzalez, Al, and uh, many other people will join us on the uh, roundtable discussion and Q and A. Um, after that, we will be in the uh, in Discord. And uh, let's share one more time the Discord channel because the after party will be after, uh, like uh, after this open lecture. So I'm expecting like uh, in one uh, one and a half hour later uh, we will we will have the um, after party. But feel free to join the Discord channel. And tomorrow, I know that it is not accessible enough yet. But for those who have iOS de uh, device, uh, you can join our Clubhouse uh, event. We want to try this as well, since uh, it is very common right now, and uh, join the conversation or uh, bring the conversation to, to different platforms. So thank you for, for listening to us. I think it is uh, now time for Mar to uh, share uh, the, her knowledge and inspire us. And then please, uh, we, we will uh, have uh, maybe one poll that we can start now. Uh, but please, if you have any question, don't write from Q, uh, from the chat window. Directly ask your question through Q&A uh, window because otherwise it is very difficult for us to follow all the questions. So, Mar, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we know that you are very busy. Uh, there are many uh, different projects and initiatives that you are uh, bringing to the industry, to the research network. So thank you for, first of all, being so active for the industry, for the research uh, scene. And um, we are very like happy to see you here. And uh, it will be great to, to have maybe a little bit of an uh, intro about yourself. And uh, we are happy to see, hear more about the locomotion and avatars and haptics beyond. Sounds great. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Uh, I think you need to stop sharing. Okay, good. Um, and I'll try to, yeah, to walk you around the many things we're doing. Uh, also, I hope the um, you can see the subscripts here, the subtitles. If somebody's hard hearing or um, uh, that that is something that's actually available for anyone who uses uh, PowerPoint, and it's super helpful. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about mostly about VR locomotion, but I wanted to give a little of um, information about what we're doing on avatars on haptics, because those are initiatives that I think are also interesting for everyone here. You can find me on Twitter. I also have a, a website uh, that is accessible for everyone. I, I more or less post things there that are important. Um, so this is kind of me. I've been a bit all over the place doing my PhD uh, in different places. I work, uh, I moved into industry first in Airbus. I work a little bit on a startup world also, and then finally came to Microsoft Research. Uh, and I've done work on systems, on perception, things about generic HRTFs in VR, uh, measuring latency on VR, motion sickness. All these are big problems in VR. Uh, I won't enter very much in detail. I just want to give this glimpse of the many things. A lot of work on avatars also. 
uh, things that are becoming very relevant, like measuring embodiment. How do we have a standardized ways to do that? Um, and we did, you know, like super big analysis of uh, questions, then did the 400 questionnaires, analyze whether these questions were good or bad. Um, check it out if you're measuring embodiment. We're open sourcing assets uh, a lot. This is uh, maybe 30% of our time now. Um, getting, you know, we see the meta humans in a Unreal Engine and they are awesome. Um, and, and there will be more of that, but I think like super easy to use things um, to start are also very important, right? Like, so people can build up up to, to those uh, much higher levels. Uh, how to build a lab, uh, theories, uh, follower effect. We presented last year, it got an award. Things about facial expression, lookalike avatars, perception and behavior in general. And then all these work on haptics, which have a theoretical background, right? Like from the uncanny valley of haptics, all this asymmetry of grasp, uh, work on haptic retargeting, uh, working with Jaron uh, and so on. Um, but so all of this work, it seems a lot, but I wanna give this idea of why are we doing all of this, right? So there has been a paradigm shift and, and this is becoming more obvious. Uh, once we move into VR or AR or spatial computing in general, the user enters inside the content, okay? The content is no longer inside the screen just. So this brings completely new problems. And I think everyone here is interested on those problems. Uh, and I focus on three areas of research mostly on this new paradigm shift. One is how do we represent the users? And that's why I work on avatars. The other is how do we touch these virtual objects? Because rendering is so good with the visual, but you know, the haptics are still not there. And how do we move, right? Like uh, things that are not a problem in reality about moving, become an open world <laughs> inside the spatial computing. So um, I wanna go a bit more about haptics and this is the dream team here at Microsoft. And we have also former members and interns and we have coverage every time we publish one of our prototypes. Um, we try to make it very entertaining also. I'm gonna highlight three of our haptic devices that I think everyone here should uh, keep in mind. And if you're working on haptics, maybe have those as inspirations. So the first one is being Torque. Uh, this is one that we created in 2015 and uh, 19. And um, the main idea here is, can we create a rigid controller that gives you illusion of elasticity or such. And here is the normal interactions you would have with an object. And that's what we wanna recreate. So uh, we go ahead, we build this on top of um, uh, a controller for VR. And there are a couple of interactions that you can do with it. Uh, for example, have a pressure sensor to control a hand. So it really feels like that's your hand and then put an object inside, um, feel compliance over the object and be able to feel texture over the object. So I think there is a part here that is very nice. Okay, so this is the simulation here. Let me see. That we're able to create completely out of the sensors of apps. Try again. Okay, let's see when this ends. We do the exact same thing uh, with Torque, right? So this is a virtual object and we're controlling it just uh, with our device. So uh, then we did some other work on, um, this one was inspired Capstan Crunch on this idea. Could we crunch a can of Coca-Cola, right? Like how do you do that? Uh, and, and then the type of experience that you touch the surface, then you push, then it starts breaking, and then like you don't, you cannot go further. So we started working on this type of uh, prototypes, and we came up, um, you know, the, the uh, mic is very much on the mechanical design, and uh, we designed this 
sort of uh, capstan system, which is like uh, inspired on boats. We won some awards with this too. Um, check it out if you're more interested. And this is one that you saw because we released it very, you know, I, I think it was December or November, um, which is the pivot. And this one is extremely satisfying when you're playing with it, right? Like you go grab this apple and pff, you get it right in your hand. Uh, it has many other uh, very interesting effects on it, but this idea that you go for a virtual object and you're able to actually grasp it, it's mind blowing. After you try, you, you cannot go back, right? Uh, we play with different versions of it. Uh, you know, maybe you could have a controller that comes to you. It doesn't need to be a very specific uh, home, you know, like a professionally made this. Maybe it's easier to build just a handle or... So all of these things should be inspiring for anyone doing haptics. The other part I want to talk about very quickly is our assets that we're releasing. And we're releasing for everyone to use freely. Initially, we were uh, mostly releasing only for academic and research use. But now it's for everyone. And we have first the avatars. And now we have been releasing tools for animating those avatars. So let me just show you a bit the type of avatars we're talking about. And you probably seen it. You can download them from GitHub. Uh, they are FBX files um, that uh, have full rigging, even in the face. Uh, you know, I was reading today 120 bones on the meta human of uh, uh, Unreal. This is not there, right? Uh, but um, we're also building now a new tool to be able to animate easier. Uh, with blend shapes and compatibility with open face and these type of things. Mark, uh, yeah. sorry, uh, sometimes in your, not like right now, uh, sometimes the uh, the bar is closing the title. Uh, in the, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know uh, what. Oh, is I think it's because the yeah, chat is service. keeping appearing. I don't know how to change that. Okay, maybe you can change the uh, positioning of this. To make sure because uh, it's directly coming to ah, yeah okay i'll put it here it might crop a bit the the subtitles but okay. it will be better yeah, okay great. Great. sounds good and this is the mock-up library uh we created right like sometimes when i was working with avatars like building these proper behavior experiments it can take six months just to animate the avatars and do all of that so uh the goal here is to be much faster and so people can do it very easily uh, we presented this in December in AI VR. Realistic avatars are an essential component for creating social interactions in virtual reality. However, the main issue faced by small labs is a lack of simple self-creation animation tools. In this paper, we present Movebox, a plug-and-play toolbox that aims to provide resources for motion capture and animation of the Microsoft Rocketbox avatars without the need for professional equipment. Okay, so that was done just there very quickly right? Um, it took as long as you see to make. <laughs> uh, so super, super easy. We went and say, okay, we have very good depth sensing cameras. They already give us skeletons. Let's build the, the pipeline. So this can go directly in real time to, to our avatars. And we have three different projects in here. One is this real time um, capture studio that we create that can capture and replay. And that has a bit of uh, extra lip sync or blink sync, uh, which are not uh, as good as what we are producing now on only focus on the head box, right? Like uh, it's gonna be uh, compatible with Oculus lip sync or salsa or, you know, uh, so it's gonna be better. Here is just like a volume detector and open and, and close the jaw. Uh, and then you have this other, project that has MRTK or Oculus Quest hand tracking and inverse kinematics on the upper body, all for free uh, and easy to use for embodiment of avatars in first person in real time. And then the last one is uh, compatibility with the Vive 3D, which is this Max Planck created uh, um, tool that they have also open source. Um, 
and that allows you to, for example, use video from uh, YouTube and retrieve skeletons, and those skeletons can go also on our avatars. You can read more of this uh, outside. So I'm going to go back to these three problems that we're uh, trying to, to work on here. Um, and I'm going to go back to the how we move. Okay, because uh, today is going to be about that. But if anyone has interest on the other topics, I'm very happy to answer through Twitter or collaborate more with you. And, you know, we have a strong uh, push toward open sourcing also here. So this is what happened when you enter a virtual environment. It's an awesome environment, super big, a whole city. And this is my, here down on the right, my actual physical environment and it's not bad it's a dedicated space for vr you know it's, it could be much worse and aha uh -huh, this is how far i get <laughs> in the virtual city uh so we we definitely need more things uh right and this is a person who's wearing foot tracking and you know like it has quite a good uh, tracking system but it's still with that super link so this was actually the first uh, experiment I did on locomotion and trying to think about it was like, okay, this is the biggest problem, right? Or that I thought that um, you have these very large virtual environments and you have a very constrained physical environment. So you want to walk uh, through there. Um, we presented this in Kai in 2019. With room scale tracking and wireless headsets, users can walk around in virtual environments. We can create magical experiences that enable users to travel much farther in virtual reality than they walk in the real world. We explore three such methods. Ground level scaling turns users into a giant. Eye level scaling allows users to walk through a miniature world that's been raised up to maintain their eye level. With seven link boots, every step the user takes appears longer. And I would say the main learning from all these experiments was that they're compromised. Okay, if you're a giant, you have the more better perception of where you are. If you have these uh, seven league boots, you have very little control of where you stop. And if you have the, uh, you know, this worldly miniature type of effect, then oh, you can see the door name on the door, right? Like. But which one do you want? It might differ from one case to another. And it was to us that millions of options for locomotion just after doing this. So we also found another interesting thing that um, I think it's worth mentioning. We did a, a side project on this in which we asked people to walk to a specific point, um, sort of with their eyes closed. We would show the virtual world and then blank and then ask them to walk there. And there is this effect that is very well known, which is distance compression. And I think it could, I'm mentioning this because I think it's interesting as a measure of how well your locomotion technique might be working, is how uh, you know you uh, create this mental map. And, and I'll talk a bit more about this, but the main idea is that in general, in virtual reality, people have a distance compression of 10 or 20%. This is, if you're asking people to walk 10 meters, they undershoot by one meter or two, uh, which is quite a lot. But this can be better compensated if people are given a good avatar, right? So this is all related, right? Like avatars are important in that way. Uh, because in reality, I know how big, um, you know, this bottle is because I compare it to my own body, my hand, I know what the size of my hand is, it's something I have super interiorized, so I can know how big things are. And the same happens with our body and the distance of things. And so that was something very interesting for us to see that people who were highly embodied on their avatar didn't have a distance compression. Then we did some more work with different techniques, right? We were playing with eye trackers in this work in, uh, here and then one of the things that happened and we were exploring applications and one of the things that happened here is that you know you could use them for virtual locomotion too like uh, if you're looking somewhere you can reduce motion sickness this way and um, instead of just um, you know having this dash point anywhere we can have it just where you're looking at. So you could still explore the whole experience or the whole world if you move 
and then have a, a better field of view of uh, as you in, increase with the eye tracking, right? So these are type of locomotion ideas that you could have embedded on eye tracking. So this was also work on a particular effect that you could have with locomotion and eye tracking. But in general, all of this, what it was bringing us is to this idea that there are many techniques. So we, uh, one day I was talking to Max, he moved back to uh, Birmingham and he was, you know, we wanna do something together. And we were saying, okay, locomotion, I feel is this thing that we need to learn more about. And so we started setting up in a, a Google spreadsheet and some people have asked me like, how do you decide how, like, where do you put these things? And I'm like a spreadsheet, right? Like an Excel spreadsheet. And, and then you start adding columns, start adding rows, and then you see, wow, the magnitude of this is impossible to, to even uh, figure out where you are. So the moment we got about, I think it was 25 techniques, it was very clear we will hit 100 easily. So uh, we contacted Hasti. Hasti had, had been working quite a lot on visualization of um, uh, techniques for haptics, but um, she also had this one about the vibrations um, uh, tools for and what the perception were and like multi uh, scalar type of thing. So uh, we we asked her to, to join us to kind of be able to visualize and navigate this database. And there were many things that happened through our creation of the locomotion bolt. And I wanna talk about it today because I think the methodology, <clears throat> one of the things about the methodology is that we were making the methodology as we went, right? Things that were important were becoming more important. And for those of you who haven't seen the locomotion ball, let me show you what it more or less is. <clears throat> so we have a bunch of techniques and we have created this similarity graph that you can go through them. Uh, what technique is similar to other. We have a gallery. This was super important for us. Like we needed to visualize things. Otherwise it's very hard to, to understand what the technique is doing. And even with the visualization, sometimes you need to read the descriptions. So the descriptions, we worked a lot on the descriptions and we had a, an undergrad student who was awesome and became like this super expert also. I mean, all of us became these super experts on very weird techniques, but you know, like, uh, there are some teleporting techniques that depend on which feed it is the turn of the walk will land in a very in a slightly different way. You know, it's super interesting to, to just uh, read also the descriptions once you enter very deep. So you can have this overview uh, or you can have this, this very deep experience. And then you can go and say, hey, I want a high spatial awareness, low nausea, high embodiment, and I wanna be able to multitask. And then you end up with these three possible techniques. So I feel it's interesting for people that are both in academia or industry to explore this database and find out where are gaps uh, to create new techniques. And you know, what type of things could be compatible to have more or two um, techniques of locomotion in your games. Or, uh, you know, I, I feel like we're moving away from a single, locomotion technique for, for a game. It should be a choice by the user. But the first thing we did is, oh, who has worked on locomotions, right? And we found many taxonomies. Each was proposing different attributes, right? Like here on the, on the vertical. And here on the horizontal, we have all these ta different taxonomies and they had different attributes that they found were important. And then we map them to Okay, we're gonna tackle all of these, but we're gonna maybe change their names or you know uh, converge them because they have different names in, across the different taxonomies. Um, so we're like, okay, this seems important for us to figure out how we describe our locomotion techniques. But we were not gonna do a taxonomy, right? I feel like a taxonomy is something that you have to be able to say, a good description of what you have and a good description of what you don't have, where the gaps are. And I think we are so far from even knowing where the gaps are at this point that I, I don't think we're ready for taxonomies. Uh, and then we went and we put these attributes and there was one of them that I had been working already quite a lot 
uh, because of other reasons, and I'll explain a little bit, which was spatial awareness also. Spatial awareness is this idea that, oh, you teleport somewhere and you have no idea where things are anymore. Right, like you have to look around to figure out, oh, I'm here now, right? To create this mental map, something very hard to do mental mapping. And I wanna show a little bit of this other work that we've been doing on mental mapping with Soundscape, which is an app that drives you around the space, but instead of like, you know, the typical GPS navigation of turn right, turn left, this gives you like, um, sound somewhere in the space and you walk through it. Like, you know, when we were a caveman and we would hear some water and know, oh, there is source of water there, like a fountain or, you know, like a, um, a waterfall and you would walk towards the sound. And you would also create a mental map as you're going to be able to return to your village, right? So I, I feel like that type of perceptual guidance is something that um, and perception is something that guides a lot of my work. Um, so we were creating this type of effect. So let me show you this short video of what sounds good. GPS works. apps on our mobile phones have certainly allowed us to go further and reach and explore places. However, we might have a modern paradox for navigation. At the same time that apps allow us to explore more, they also have the capacity to make us worse explorers. In fact, current turn-by-turn -turn navigation promotes a passive form of navigation that does not support learning or the formation of cognitive maps. We suggest that a different type of GPS navigation might be possible with the use of 3D spatialized audio. By positioning auditory beacons at the destination, users of GPS can regain an active role to navigate the space. This way, so I think for everyone who's working on locomotion, this is an app that is uh, available at least in iOS. We're trying to work uh, for, for Android too. Uh, but this is an app that when you're exploring a space, it brings you to the same spots that you're trying to go, but look at the level of exploration you're seeing here versus the turn by turn, right? And if you wanna know your neighborhood or uh, I feel like this is a very different thing. And also here we didn't test this, but uh, the app has this tool that as you're walking here, it says like, hey, to your right, you have this thing, to your left, you. So it's very, very different for creating a mental map. And I feel like this could be inspiring also for, for VR locomotion because uh, we're talking about um, this embedded layer of, of information on top of uh, where you're locomoting. And this is how good or bad people were later at uh, positioning where things uh, were on the map uh, and a bit the mental map that they had created. Um, a person moving through the whole space and that's it. So mental maps was a very important attribute for me, but then we also were like, oh, we have so many techniques that we need meta attributes, right? Like we need things like this ambiguation of uh, why is this different than other similar things or uh, things that have to do with who created this, when, um, more about the description of this, uh, do we add an image? Does it have an actual scientific study combined with it? Uh, there are examples of games that we can play this same thing. So there, not every attribute is in the database. But we, you know, we were working on this for almost a year. So I, I feel like we did a very deep uh, work on it, uh, also on the meta attributes. So we ended up with this database metadata and the actual attributes. And I, after, you know, spatial awareness, the other one that I really wanna, um, you know, highlight is category because category is something that is a combination of the other attributes. and. So once you have many uh, possible techniques, you can do analysis that no one else has been able to do before. Because if you created taxonomies with three, four techniques, the level of analysis you can do is more based on user studies. So here we start doing the typical analysis. You would say like, oh, you know, let's see when were locomotion techniques created. And we can see like, oh, you know, after 2015, for obvious reasons, things are uh, kind of kicking up and we have more techniques every year. And I mean, some of the things here 
might be higher, right? Like we didn't maybe have access to all the things that were happening in 2019, 2020, and you know, so this might be a bit higher, but we can clearly see a difference pre and post VR becoming more clear. And then here we can see which techniques or which type of categories are increasing in techniques, right? Like some of them like movement, uh, are increasing and this is clear the more motion tracking you have the more techniques you have on movement uh, for example here we have almost nothing about eye tracking i think eye tracking will also increase as we have eye tracking right like all depending on the technology you'll have more things and maybe some of the conditions we have uh, categories might increase right uh, i would consider eye tracking as a gesture probably but you know that that's all up for discussion so that's why I don't think this should be a taxonomy. It's more like, hey, let's uh, <laughs> uh, figure things out and improve it on a live database. Um, so here we also can see like, hey, at the beginning, we were only doing Roman scale and was like the majority of things, which was also super complicated. Like you look at Vicky Terrantes work, she won the award of IEEE VR career award last year. And it's this massive technology to be able to track a uh, room scale person walking around, right? It, it was very hard back then. Uh, and now it seems like room scale, it's not so important anymore. And, you know, we're seeing all, it's interesting just to look at these things. And in our full paper in Kai, you can look at more at that. And then the other interesting thing is when you have so many attributes, you start having multidimensional problems. So we did some multidimensional scaling of uh, the attributes, right? Like, hey, this, uh, technique has the attributes almost like this other technique and so we had to give like numerical values to some of the techniques um, you know high low um, very high for example nausea right and then you can uh, sort of um, numerize these values instead of you know giving giving um more deterministic uh, aspects to each one of the attributes and then you can start having clusters and it's interesting because the clusters are also categories if you see like if you have a cluster here it happens to be this category and you don't really have a vehicle type of uh, locomotion sitting over there and and that is just based on the data. Then we had some experts also doing this similarity. So we had the database similarity or the expert similarity, which were, hey, the four of us who were just crazy about every single thing that you see here. We we can just talk about it for for some minutes. <laughs> uh, and then we were like, oh, you know, pedaling looks a bit like the steeper. And, and there are indeed many cases in which the similarity happens across the same category, but there are some cases in which we find similarities that, you know, Superman flight is not a vehicle, but it looks very much like flying, okay? So we, we, these things are things that the expert will find, but maybe the database will not find. Or, uh, so we have these two different type of uh, similarities. So what we did also with all these similarities, uh, we put them together after finding this multidimensional scaling uh, with these numerical values. Um, we did a symbolic regression. It's, this is, a, as I was saying, this type of complex analysis is something that you can only do when you have a reasonable number of samples, right? So no one has been able to do this before. Uh, and this is complicated. So symbolic regression, what it does is uh, we said, okay, can we, can, could we describe the category just by saying which attributes are there, right? Like if I put all the attributes in the system, will it tell me, oh, is this category, right? This is what symbolic regression would do. Uh, and then you'll end up with a formula. So we, we weren't really confident about one formula being the killer but we really were more interested in seeing out of the high fitted formulas, you know, like it's fitting the, the data very nicely on the observed predicted uh, regression, which, which attributes are more prevalent? Like there is always something about accessibility, direction and nausea. And these three are super common in these formulas here. So what we, can say, and we, we don't feel like we should just provide an, an equation, but we can say that category is mostly dependent 
on accessibility, direction of movement, and nausea. Okay, so with these three, you can actually describe most of the categories. Uh, and then you start having this from this multidimensional to a linear scale. And linear scales are so much easier to interpret in a way. Um, and then, you know, we put them there and we were like, okay, this is quite real life, right? Room scale. But if you add gestures of movements, um, you know, it can reduce the room scale in a different way, but it will have effects on how accessible things are, the nausea and the direction of movement. So here there will be less nausea, but it will also be less accessible because if you have some embodied problem that you body problem that you cannot move in a certain way you're not going to be able to perform here right and then it will also limit a bit your direction of movement because hey how much can you move in you know we cannot really fly in real life so it, it does limit a bit that the moment you go towards a controller right like you start doing things more relative you're on a vehicle you can teleport you just move with the controller oh you're super accessible, right? You could have all sorts of types of controllers. You could move it with your mouth if you need it, uh, but it will increase the nausea. And it also gives you all this opportunity about direction of movement. So I, I think like these three aspects are actually very important and people have worked on them a lot. One of the things that for me is very frustrating as a researcher is that when you work on a nausea or motion sickness, your paper will be rejected almost immediately, right? Because they, they cite this, you know, the reviewers, it's a very tough community and the reviewers will go and say, hey, we have this NASA and military uh, experiment, super documented, how is this different or better, right? And we're, I'm like, oh, you know, this, it's so boring we're even starting this conversation because I mean look at the technology they were using we're talking now about a very different area so I think actually this um, maybe the gap to bridge there is to talk about sickness in locomotion right like in a particular locomotion technique and then it becomes very particular to that locomotion and it might become again a new way to to a um, reframe work on, on motion sickness and, and have more community work in there. Because if, if you don't have a ability to, to publish there from the academic side, you will not advance on the knowledge we have there. So I think maybe linking this uh, locomotion with these different three uh, main attributes could be a way to, to have a bigger locomotion uh, community, which mm, right now it's a bit missing right like you go to big vr conferences and the locomotion track is very limited which is something we're also trying to to change a bit so maybe some of you have seen that already but i wanted to highlight this sort of five super funny uh, crazy <laughs> techniques uh like i mean this one is, is is it's just nuts right like your camera is actually on your head and you throw your head around so <laughs> That's how you move. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you have a very, maybe that creates a very good mental map, but I'm sure it also creates now. So this is super nice um, because you move your hands and there are many experiences that you move your hand, but the visual is like you are hand walking, right? Like upside down hand, hand walking. And it really feels like your legs and your hands are so, sort of related. Um, I like this one because of the granularity that it gives. This one is also very crazy and it's, it's very inspiring that you use something that people know very well indeed. It's gravity, right? It, it's super intuitive, um, but just in a very crazy way, right? Like now my floor is somewhere else and then that's how you move somewhere. And these ones are actually great for nausea, reducing nausea, the ones in which you have a lot of control over um, an, sort of like an elevator type of thing. So you, you don't feel like you're actually moving on the outside the space so much. And it reminds me, you know, now with the pandemic to this type of um, uh, concerts. 
So what we're trying to do um, with the locomotion ball, the, the main goal has been to explore, contribute, collaborate, and create. And that's why, you know, the, the website, you know, it could be much better, but the main idea is that you can enter new techniques or suggest changes because there are for sure errors here, things we missed. And, uh, you know, I think if you explore around it, um, that will be easy. That's why also we're, we're connecting everything with Git. Um, so the changes appear on the GitHub and it's easier for us to track and like eventually we can um, have some sort of credit thing that, uh, you know, we, we can credit contributors, right? Like the idea is that this is not us, it's the community who, who is building this tool and maintaining the tool. And, and it's important that it's interactive in that sense. So currently we have a hundred LTs. Also, we were not picky. Some of them have never been studied on academic in, uh, context, right? They were created by a developer. They're awesome and should be featured here. And if an academic has not even learned about it, now it's time to rethink and maybe test things about it. So in order to facilitate that, the next thing we're doing, it's implementing these techniques. Uh, many of them are implemented, right? But they are not in a common repo. Uh, so we're, we're gonna be launching a quest probably starting uh, fall next year, in, mainly with academic universities, but you know, if developers want to join, um, the main idea is that uh, professors will be assigning uh, the implementation of a particular technique to a student or a group of students. And uh, we're gonna be giving them the architecture of what the um, class should look like. So they sort of inherit and, and implement the, the, the different um, um, functions in the class. And, and the idea is that then it's interchangeable, right? Like if I have this locomotion technique, but I want another one, I just flip it. So it means that Hey, if you are a developer building a, a new <laughs> uh, tool, uh, it's very easy for you. A new a new game is very easy for you with this uh, database to provide this sort of passport in which the user will choose which uh, locomotion you're gonna have, right? And and you might wanna ban some locomotions in particular places, like you have that already in in some games where you cannot teleport while you're being shot at in first person, right? Like then, you know, you can only teleport when uh, there is no actual uh, scene happening in, at that moment. And we will see more of that, right? Like if you have a variety, and I think we're moving to this point in which, even if you look at Alex, uh, you have more than one locomotion technique inside Alex. Sometimes you can do a room scale and sometimes you do their locomotion technique, uh, their, their teleport. So with all of that, <laughs> I want to give thanks. And also I want to highlight that uh, we do collaborate a lot with the other people for our open source, for our projects. And if, if you want to collaborate in something in particular, uh, please reach out. Um, and you know, there is a bunch of people working with me to uh, mostly Eyal, for example, uh, we collaborate a lot with Michael on the haptic uh, devices and um, we have visitors sometimes to work on particular topics and I wanted to have some time to go into the actual uh, uh, database so let me and, and we can do some questions while I'm on the on the database so let me share sure. my Thank screen you. again Thank you, Mar, for this very inspiring presentation. But beyond that, a resource maybe we will use many, many years uh, as developers, as researchers. So uh, thank you for that. I'm thinking of, I think we need Vault for any kind of different uh, techniques being used in, in VR and AR. I know, like hand gestures, uh, yeah. interactions. So are you- I mean, that's partially- yeah. The reason why you can download the whole, uh, uh, it's open source, the whole backend of this uh, website. And that was something, you know, it was 
great to talk to Hasti about this because she was uh, very clear that she wanted to also open source the website in the same way that we were open sourcing everything. So this website, you can download it and change locomotion for whatever else you want, right? Uh, and implement uh, already from this sort of a skeleton. Uh, and I think that that's important and I agree, like you could have this for haptic controllers, for, I, um, I, I feel like we're getting to a point in which it's exploding so much the field that it's no longer possible that a single individual knows everything, yeah. right? Uh, some there are some good scholars that keep on track, but you know we we want to have a collective uh, intelligence here, and this is the only way I I feel. Definitely, and the 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 way that is being designed is also quite uh, like beyond tagging system. You also even create a very nice correlation. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's great. What I suggest is maybe uh, we can still keep this. Because uh, the questions, some of them are related, locomotion related ones might be uh, directly related and you can even show here or through your slides. Sounds so, good. Um, I will also uh, invite a few of our uh, like trainers, alumni, so they may directly ask question in person mm -hmm. as well. And um, before that, we also want to understand better um, for which purpose that you are using these locomotion techniques or avatars. Uh, so that's why we started a poll. Uh, so please uh, feel free to, to um, answer the question. It is great to hear more about, is it your focus is games or uh, enterprise applications, educational applications. So I'm happy to hear more about that. So shall we start? Um, maybe I can a little bit um, start asking questions and I will also invite a few more uh, people here. So uh, I'm starting from, from the first one. Have any of you on the panel or audience seen 3D on the PluraView 3D Stereo Monitor? Do you have any? I, I, I have not heard this before. I, yeah, I haven't tried it. Um... Also, I think the pandemic is limiting a bit the type of things that you can try, right? Like that's the type of thing that if you're in the office, you like it's easier to, to find, especially if, if you're working on a larger uh, corporation, somebody's gonna have something that's gonna show you. I miss that a lot. <laughs> so we have over 30 questions. I mean, we will try to answer uh, most of them today, but tomorrow also uh, we can continue in the Clubhouse event. So uh, that is the question that I wanted to actually ask so that's good that someone also think the same. Uh, how does your avatar uh, system compare to MetaHuman by Epic? Uh, yeah, I mean, as I say during the talk, I think it's a very different type of uh, tool. Um, well, MetaHuman, it's great. I mean, it's awesome, looks great. Uh, it has, uh, for the moment, just two avatars. Uh, it has 120 bones only on the face which is, you know, a lot of bones for you to control. Open face tracks, I think 16 points on your face. So you see like, I mean, going from, from a, a, a cheap solution on a webcam to there, and I've seen some demos already that look amazing. Eh? I, and even with open face or open post type of facial tracking. Uh, but um, I sort of feel like it's, it's very nice how they're building in for very top end and it com it's compatible with low end. I think as a starter level, it might be easier to work on our avatars and then move to the metahuman. Metahuman doesn't have the variety of uh, gender, races, everything. It's also very much uh, focused on the face at the moment. It has full rigging. For me, the biggest thing about this is that now the whole rigging system on Unreal is so much better, right? Like they are, the fact that they have their own product in in, in it, it's gonna make it so much better. Uh, because the biggest problem for now has been interface. It's gonna be easier even to have our avatars in, in Unreal and we're releasing very soon a tool to import them very nicely like we have for Unity. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, so I think it's a, it could be like a starter point for then uh, use the metahuman and, and maybe the people who are using one don't want to use the other one or, uh, uh, you know, there, there might be, uh, we will see how it plays, but we're not competing. We're trying to provide assets so people um, can use more of these. And I feel like we're being validated by other people who are also releasing assets that this is the way to go, right? Without assets, there is no people working on things. And I think uh, that that's great when we see more people releasing assets. And same goes for the Mixamo avatars, right? Like these are great assets. Uh, yeah, so let me quickly go to a, another question. Can you please elaborate on best practices for identity and access management for avatars? Yeah, this is super interesting, right? Um, identity. Well, ideally, the best would be that you can have an avatar and bring it across whatever uh, game you're going or social VR and you come with your avatar like a passport. Uh, well, first, this is not possible right now. <laughs> we have a very interesting uh, South by Southwest uh, panel coming this year. We just recorded it. Uh, with Timony West, who is the VP of VR there, and, and a couple of other four folks. Uh, and we're talking about identity a little bit there. And it's, um, it's interesting because first, it's not supported to just have one identity. Second, it's not clear people want to have only one identity, right? And maybe you want to have different identities. In the same way in life, right? Like you're in your family, you behave in a way and you're a different person than when you're professionally or uh, so we, we have to understand that the identity might be complex and maybe some people want to look alike and maybe some people don't want to look alike. So that that's how divergent things are. Um, but clearly something that we want to be very careful is with the identity theft. <laughs> yeah. No matter how this should be a concern for anybody working on avatars. Um, we are not working particularly on that aspect, but I do realize that is a concern. Uh, best practices is be careful to not be supporting identity theft. Uh, and I would actually like to see a standard that would be able to transfer avatars easily without having to build a whole new importer, right? Like we're now building for Unreal and we have one for Unity and every time you wanna import an FBX, which, you know, it's like a standard. <laughs> a file you need to have an import uh, system and actually the folks in uh, max Planck are using our avatars and they uh, build this unreal importer so i'm uh, you know fixing th some things in order to release uh, the tool they have contributed which is something that i love right like when people are starting to contribute to our work on our assets because these are problems they are finding and they if you ever find a problem more people have the same problem so try to solve it for everyone yeah definitely like cumulative and collective effort will be the best thing um i i also like to ask to our uh, panelists i mean the round table discussion right so maybe someone from the from the uh, panelists that uh, I just edit them from our uh, researchers or uh, uh, partners, alumni. So anyone who would like to hey. ask from us? Hi. 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 <laughs> Great talk. Thanks uh, uh, for, for showing us all this and especially also for the free resources. Um, so um, you talked uh, about accessibility as almost an ingrained part of the locomotion but usually in ux uh, it's also much about prior experience and habits and and how commonly used some something is do you do you track uh, for for this how often a certain technique is is used in 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 products in certain let's say for games or for enterprise that 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 would be valuable i think so uh yes we have uh i want to answer in two ways i think accessibility is an issue for whole spatial computing, not only for locomotion. This is the first time we have a new type of computing that is less accessible than any prior computing. Because this idea that you enter with your body, 
right? And that you enter into a virtual environment versus until now it's been a more abstract uh, content, right? So you could access with a mouse, uh, you don't need to have the level of motion that you need for a full body, right? So all the interactions, like what if I cannot reach my hand here? What if my arm is shorter? What if like all these things that we were having on, on um, uh, industrial design for cars or like can you reach the radio becomes again an issue here in VR, right? So I, I would say accessibility is way beyond. Um, we have a, a paper on um, on this idea of, uh, you know, accessibility, building VR as an accessible by design, right? We're still designing VR. Let's think of accessible from the beginning. Regarding your other question, let me share my screen again. I just stopped sharing for a second. And now it seems like, um, so what we're trying to do, okay? For example, here is, um, yes, we are trying to have examples, right? Of people who have been working on this particular technique and then who created it where you can download a, a version of it that you can uh, maybe play uh, with this Crytek or, you know, so I feel like this will, right now is just one thing, but it will be like more examples and eventually there, you know, this is minimal at the moment, but this might grow in different ways. And I do understand that uh, even people will be like, hey, you know, this doesn't only appear here, it appears also somewhere else. And, and that is where we're going, right? Like, I do think it's important to know uh, who has implemented this before, especially for the, the us as developers do, right? Like you want to reach to someone because you don't want to do things three times, right? Replicating work is, it's very common, but it's not particularly good. Okay. So, uh, let's continue. Thank you, Thomas. Any other questions from the panelists who would like to uh, go ahead and Open your cam and ask. Otherwise, I will continue the questions coming from the uh, our uh, audience. Uh, will your Moveback system work on Mac? Well, um, part of it won't. All the part with the Kinect. So the the Capture Studio probably won't. The part of uh, that imports from the skeletons from YouTube probably will, um, because uh, that part actually uh, the you have to download the Vive 3D uh, uh, tool uh, from GitHub and be careful because that one is not for <coughs> it's only for academic use and you cannot share it. That's why we didn't share it inside our repo. Um, but that one actually runs on, on Linux. And then once you have the, the skeleton, you can import it very easily inside Unity. So if you have Unity running in Mac, you will have no problem. And then the last one is the, um, the, the first person perspective. And if you, I'm not sure if Quest with hands works on Mac. But if it does, you should be able to use it too. Perfect. By the way, we have also poll results. So 24% of the audience is uh, building or planning to build a VR game. 42% uh, is um, uh, building an enterprise application. So when I have maybe one question regarding that. As far as we see, most of the time, uh, locomotion is more important for games, but based on the use cases that you have already gathered, uh, how do you see like how enterprise and educational applications might best use of locomotion techniques? Or do you think that most of the time, especially for education, it should be like um, not room scale and everything should be much more like without locomotion? I think if we if we look at the, the accessibility problem, the moment you have a lo different locomotion techniques, you give far many options, right? Yeah. And I think even just for that, we should consider it. And I think that that's the biggest handicap right now. Like if you, in many countries, 
you have to provide the right to work for everyone. And that includes, you give them a device in which they have, a, you know, this limit accessibility to use it. And there are scores for these things. And um, in order to provide that in the same way that now you can have the mouse or like a, a tip mouse on the, on the, the you, you have to have the equivalent of that. And I think a controller, despite it gives a bit more nausea, it's much easier and also is more backward compatible. Because yes, we're moving towards very full body tracking systems, but also we have a, a lot of people, I mean, I hope people are not using cardboards anymore, but maybe some are the Samsung VR, right? And, and you know, you just have this finger thing uh, most. So you have to consider that not everyone is gonna have a, a real room scale at all even, right? So I, I do think having um, multiple ways to locomote uh, up to the choice of the user is beneficial for the whole industry, especially if it's easy, you know, like no matter where you go, you have, you're super good with this locomotion technique and you are, is the one you use. It's up to you, not to the developer. Like, you know, you buy a keyboard, it's a super weird keyboard, but hey, you're very good at it and you just it all across. Perfect, thank you for the answer, Mar. I'm really uh, trying to f uh, f a little bit like have more questions because uh, we have already uh, almost 50 uh, questions pending. So um, what is the difference between the I think and the seven league boot locomotions? Yeah, this is this this is one of the problems we had, and uh, I think Bernard uh, Rickley, uh, right from, uh, you know, some of the people who have been working in locomotion for the longest time, were pinging us like, oh, this is wrong, right? Like Bexion, and there are a few things that you only see when you try it, so uh, it's very hard to describe this, but uh, seven league boots uh, works on acceleration. It doesn't make your step longer, it makes you faster. And it's kind of like if you bend forward, you go faster and then like, so the chicken, there is this chicken uh, uh, ah, locomotion technique, let me show you uh, here, oops. Uh, let me find it. Oh, I had a filter and I'll show you the, The thing, if I find it, let me share my screen. So um, yeah, the seven league boots has an acceleration uh, versus the, um, okay, this is, the, this is also called the chicken technique, right? Like you move forward or backward. This has very little control, right? Like you wanna stop, you need to be like in this precise point where you are not producing any acceleration. So seven league boots does a bit better than this because it has the feet tracking and seven league boots here. So it, it's worse on the feet. It's not just the head, but you know, it's very hard to know how much distance you're moving versus when you are on something like the ice scale, um, you're just a giant and the world is a miniature. It's like you're moving the world across. So you're, um, your step, is always the same size. It doesn't depend on how fast you're moving or, and, and the granularity is so much better. And let me find it, the eye tracking, uh, eye scale. Maybe we have a different vision of it. Do I have some, let me reload, filters. The world in miniature. Okay, this is the ground level scaling. Oh, but we have the video here of the giant. Um, okay, I should probably look at that. Okay, so well, you get the answer there, uh, bit, the difference between the two. So were you using audio to help with the vision compression too? 
Um, there are techniques that use audio. We haven't been exploring that part so much here. So if someone wants to uh, introduce more techniques around there, we're happy to, to add more things, right? Like the, the most closest thing to auditory was the galvanic stimulation. I don't know if you ever tried, but it really makes you bend in one direction or another um, for, for moving around. It's not properly audio, but it's, it's very, um, you know, oriented on the uh, head. Probably many of these techniques also have audio in them, right? Like audio design, it's very important. Um, sometimes we don't even realize about it, uh, but we didn't really explore that as an attribute or, you know, any other part in our experience. We don't talk about audio. Okay, uh, thank, uh, the, the next question from Dylan, is that based only on the height of the avatar or other factors? But I know which, uh, slide that Dylan is referring to, maybe he can create... Uh, the distance compression. Yeah, probably. Uh, well, there we scale the avatar to the height of the person, right, for that experiment. So it's just like, uh, but I, I am sure it's going to affect, right, because you get this embodiment experience. And there are many experiments that show uh, behavioral changes regarding the how tall you are. For example, if you're taller, you become more confident uh, to interact with other people or <laughs> things like that. Yeah. So uh, next question, can you detail the various animation formats used by popular file formats, FPX and UCDZ, for example? Is there an open format? How do sites like Mixamo store the animation format? Well, I cannot really talk about the Mixamo in particular, but FBX, I think it's a very good uh, standard and uh, certainly is one of the ones we have used more. Um, you know, they're also proprietary, like you, in Unity, you can store in particular, and you could just do CSV if you want, right? Like all you need is timestamp, join, position and rotation. So, uh, if, if you want to have your own uh, way of transforming from one to the other, you know, you can find a middle ground. Many of these formats are, are not binaries, right? Like you can read them. Perfect. So what eye tracking hardware were you using and how reliable was the vector? Um, yeah, we were using the, the Pro, the Vive Pro with eye tracking. Um, you can read more in the paper, uh, Miss Unseen, uh, because uh, we were doing many other things. Uh, that was just one of the applications. Uh, we were looking also at things like um, pupil dilation and more things than just eye tracking. Eye tracking wasn't, uh, was pretty good. One thing that was harder um, was the pupil dilation and this type of more detailed information from from the eye tracking hardware but yeah we were using the the pro what are your thoughts on the game called t forgot it uses procedural generation and non-euclidean geometry to give people the feeling of walking in an infinite space how can developers improve on this mechanic to make better experiences and games yeah, I mean, one thing that I didn't mention is we have this workshop going in uh, IEEE VR next month. Yeah. And impossible spaces is part of locomotion. We're not really talking about this here, but um, it hits very much perception, which is something that I really like. So I think um, we're going to have combinations in the same way that I say that audio is a combination. I think uh, we, we already see some of that here, right? Like in the techniques, there are some techniques that, um, let me see, like this one, you know, once you reach a corner, the world completely flips. So it's kind of like an invisible infinite space or, um, and, and you have a few others uh, that are also of that type that I think it's important to start finding ways in which we can implement both, especially for limited spaces when you're trying to do some sort of room scale. Uh, this is, you know, similar one, like A, you reach the, the corner, 
and then the world flips around you and hey, now you're walking in the other direction, right? So there are some of these experience that I think uh, snappy motion is also, you know, a bit of it. Uh, this one is one that you really want to read. <laughs> um, and actually this person is moving with the controller, right? Like you can have this type of infinite spaces in, uh, with controllers. It doesn't need to be just uh, room scale. Uh, by the way, I also shared the uh, um, workshops happening at IEEEAR conference. Yeah. Um, I, I, if you are interested in this locomotion and any other uh, breakthrough topics, let me say, or research topics, IEEE VR conference is the only way that you can actually um, join the, this conversation. And it's happening online, so it's more accessible than before. So rather than... Yeah, and we probably also will record it. Like the workshop, we're not going to make it super big. The, there might be audience or we might, I have to still define how we end up the, the workshop. We might have like, it's a three or four hour workshop. Maybe the last hour is something we open to the public and show, hey, this is what we've been discussing. Uh, but also we might record it. I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but the, the main idea is that people who are working on different areas on locomotion and some of the people who are working on infinite spaces uh, on the papers that I review uh, will be joining and we will be talking about all of those, uh, how, how things combine, right? Like one thing is the techniques and then the other is how do you implement in reality um, through many other aspects. Exactly. I mean, we are also supporting the IEEE VR event, so uh, happy to share more details about that uh, during the conference. Maybe you can also share here. Uh, um, let me ask this. Where is your GitHub link for your open source 3D models? Uh, here. Already <laughs> hearing. So I'm skipping this question. Uh, with all of these locomotion techniques being categorized, there must be hundreds more that were discarded. Are there any honorable mentions that looked promising but just didn't work out? Um, we tried to be as, as exhaustive as we could. We look for many games, we try many things. And the best way to, um, and this has already been something that people have been entering or like suggesting changes and entering new techniques. I think anything that has been implemented, some of them are not even on games, right? Like some of these are purely examples that the, you know, this is this is regarding also the impossible space, impossible portals. Um, this is not a particular implementation. This is, you know, but then, yeah, you can have it in, in these uh, games and try it. Sometimes you don't even realize that they are um, there. And, and so we don't really have a limit of, you know, uh, dash pointing. This one is not in a particular uh, uh, place. You know, they build this thing and it's just an example. So I, I think we can include it almost everything, we don't have a limitation on that. Uh, regard threading, this one is also, you know, a, a project, motion moon project, but it's, it's not even a, an actual game or, or it doesn't have any publication to it. Um, it's this idea that you move the controller, it's kind of like the chicken, but on the controller, right? Like you just, the direction in the real world. Okay. Hey, Fan, uh, can I ask another question? Uh, definitely. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you mentioned earlier uh, um, when we talked uh, in my first question that uh, you think um, people should be allowed to, to pick um, um, uh, techniques that work for them. Um, uh, I'm, I'm often, as a, as a designer, think kind of the other way around that you as a designer have the responsibility to pick the right method mm -hmm. for the audience to to really not you're putting too much almost on onto the user to to pick yeah. the right thing and then it's what what do you think about that yeah i think when we have so many categories and techniques 
you definitely want to do some curation before you with the user. Some users might, you know, it's, it's good if you are able to support things that they bring because some users might learn something and they don't want to move from there. But uh, I kind of like the compromise from, from Alex, right? Uh, and if you played Alex, it's this top end game, it's super nice. And you see there are more than one locomotion techniques in there. Mm. There is one that allows you to move very fast, very far away without having to move. And then there is a, you know, room scale type of uh, other option. So I think the combination of both makes it mm, more compatible with the being there for longer than 30 minutes right yeah absolutely uh, what what i yeah it, it what i mean is not uh, strictly only using one but having the designer kind of yeah. what would you mention i think also for example to, to for enable the, a certain experience yeah for the ones that have particular hardware right like if you have a hardware and you're like you love it yeah um yeah. They, having the ability to bring this thing that's why i think a, a repo that people can um, use for their own development or is compatible uh, for other people mm -hmm. to bring their things in there. I think that that's because you're not going to be building compatibility with every other thing. But on the other hand, like if, if this is a person who actually that's the only way they can locomote. <laughs> uh, that or, I, 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 you know. I thought another interesting thing uh, you said about accessibility is that you said it's it's one of the least ex with uh, XR is has one of the lowest accessibilities, which is uh, definitely true from a certain angle of, of hardware and, and, and all the different um, thing, things that are being de developed. Usually in, in when I have a talk, I, I kind of turn it around. I say it the other way around because we, we enable not an abstract interface, but a natural interface. And that's why it's, it absolutely has let's say potential to widen the target audience to, to non-computer natives. Um, so yeah. so I, I usually say it's the most accessible <laughs> compared to- Well, I mean, if, he, if you're and... talking about how people interact in the, intuitively with it, yeah. yes, yeah. there are people yeah. who cannot put a headset on, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So how do you even start? <laughs> Um, so yeah, the, depending on how you look at it. And of course, I think we're moving to a world that the non-tech natives are gonna be a rarity. I don't know, <laughs> I, maybe I live in my bubble, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, certainly the idea that you enter and very quickly, uh, intuitively understand how things work because it works like the real world. Uh, yeah. I think that that's awesome. Perfect. So, you can keep saying that. <laughs> it's good. It's not <laughs> wrong. <laughs> uh, regarding the last question uh, from the from the Q and A, I also would like to maybe give the stage to Dennis if he can hear us, or I can also share. Um, he is uh, our instructor for advanced peer interactions and hand tracking, and uh, he created actually several locomotion techniques that we are actually uh, bringing some of them to the masterclass locomotion module and mm -hmm. um, as far as I know like there were like five different techniques so um, Dennis um, I know if you at least get the chance to to talk if video is not working uh, or if you cannot I can also share so uh, we we are actually creating uh, this locomotion can you see me? I don't know if it actually works. No, we cannot, but at least uh, we can hear you. So let me try again. Okay, if it, ah, perfect. Okay. We can. So uh, I'm on a phone, so I cannot actually share the video, but if you have them available, maybe you could um, show them while I maybe talk about them. Uh, we, can, we, can, uh, we can share your uh, Twitter account so people can also check. So, but in the meantime, you can maybe mention a little bit of how hand tracking can affect a locomotion input or uh, how, what is your findings or key takeaways from the, from your locomotion techniques? As far as I know, you have, you have around five experiments, right? 
Uh, yeah, there have been several one I've been experimenting with. Um, because yeah, the, using hand tracking allows you to get way more way to input with the world than just using controller. So it's some way to make it way more natural that you really have the feeling, okay, I'm using my fingers. You get some kind of indirect feedback because you can feel your finger touching your hand while you do something. So I think one of the first one I experimented with hand tracking was uh, some uh, one which is called Me Motion. I think that already existed before with controller, but basically you pull the world be, um, like towards you. I don't know, maybe if you can show a video. Um, I mean, I, I'm sharing your, your thread here on it's, uh, so, uh, yeah, the, your work on the hand tracking is super, super interesting, really. Uh, I don't know, the, maybe this one is one of them? Or no, the, I, it's I think maybe further down, I think. Um, Maybe I can share you a direct link. Yeah, yeah I can. Uh, or maybe Sarah, if you have them available. Yeah. And um, also another one which was, uh, which I thought was really interesting uh, uh, is when you can actually use physics to move yourself around. It's, it's especially satisfying and immersive when you use hand tracking and physics to move yourself around. Um, uh, one way was just to grab and climb and just using, that was already existing just with controller, but being able to, to grab like pipes or a ladder, but also being able to push yourself and use the environment physically with hand tracking and having bones um, on your virtual hands and being able to use that while you move yourself around was a really interesting and immersive way to, to explore it. And um, another way was also the deri deri derivative of this one is that you could actually use your hand to walk uh, on a floor, like some kind of baby hands, but because it's fully physics based, it really feels, uh, I think, yeah, this one exactly, that you can, uh -huh, nice. that, in that case, you basically walk on a desk because then the floor or like some kind of floor is at, your, uh, at the height of your chest, more or less. So you can really walk as if you were on the this floor. This reminds me of the handstand mm -hmm. one, but with actual hands because that one was with controllers i think this would be yeah. even crazier right the feeling very but nice in this case it's kind of fun because it really uses friction and actual physics so it actually mimics as if you would do it for yourself i think you can see here yeah the yellow hands are actually where your real hands are so it uses physics constraint to really make you feel okay i'm walking in the virtual space even though you don't have any app haptics of course in that case but you actually can somehow feel it because you see that your hands are actually laying on the desk and they push, pull you basically forward. Uh, th this was another one, which is also a little, just a der derivation of the other one, which is still physics based. You can actually use moving part of the environment and use the physical interaction with your finger to basically use that as a some kind of locomotion system. So in this case, it's just a conveyor belt. You could just grab it or just put your finger in the slit so you could just pull yourself around. Yeah, this reminds me a bit of the elevator type of uh, examples, uh, which are, you know, are super nice. Some of them are crazy, right? Like they can, because this one moves in this particular direction, I think it might be better for nausea, but those elevator ones, sometimes they move in whatever direction. Um, Nice. And uh, yeah, I think this one is the, the, the first I explained is uh, basically using or being able to hold fixed object in the real world. I think that was already done quite a lot with controllers, but here you have the additional layer of being able to see your finger hands. and you can yeah really use the physical world to move yourself around. Yeah, that's nice. I like the ISS station, right? When you enter the Oculus, uh, and and you can play with the ISS, uh, which is similar because you have no gravity, so you have to grab at places. With the controllers, it's quite hard actually. I think maybe with the hands would be more natural. Uh, I think one of the main challenge was to deal what happens when you lose tracking, especially mm -hmm. when you climb. Uh -huh. Then you you put your hand out of the field of view. So what should you, should you do in that case? Uh, because if you really follow where the hand goes and the tracking is bad, then it could make you like move around or, or glitch. And that could be actually really bad for uh, motion sickness in the uh, induction. So here, yeah, basically there are like several ways to deal with that. As soon as the tracking gets bad, you just lock your hand in place relative to where your head is. So it doesn't move anymore and it cannot let go. 
and only when the tracking is good again. So if you basically look at your hand then and you open your hand, then you can continue the climbing experience. So it's of course as not precise and as satisfying with controller, but it brings another layer of immersion at control. Yeah. Uh, Very nice. This is part of the class, as far as I know, locomotion, this locomotion you uh... the teleportation, yes. This one, uh, well, it's this one is a more complex version because you can basically teleport in every dimension, but this is the one we, we have part of the class, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that one is awesome. I tried a similar one without the hands. I actually, now that you're showing this, I'm like, hey, you know, just adding hands becomes a completely new thing for almost all the techniques that we're showing here, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of a controller, because many of them are in, in a way or another, you're gonna end up controlling with them, uh, with this. I I think eye tracking can also be something that you can yes. uh, utilize. At least the orientation parts can be solved. Mm -hmm. Completely. I think, uh, you know, there this uh, everything that we're going to add mm -hmm. is going to become, uh, from the technology, is going to become more control or more granularity or more... Uh, interactive uh, for any of the techniques, right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, anything that you would like to ask? Um, uh, yeah. I, or Kyle? Sorry, yeah. Hey, Farn, how's it going? Yeah, I, I know we're like over, so I don't want to, you know, jump in and, and ask a question. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's make it yeah. almost uh, two more questions and, yeah. and uh, so, we have some more time tomorrow. Yeah, we have more time tomorrow, yes. So, I yeah. wanted to yeah. share this uh, very quickly. I was trying to, okay. to find, which is this uh, hooking, uh, grappling hook, which is kind of a bit similar in the sense that you throw this and needs to attach to something, but it's not with the hand, right? Like it's, uh, they're doing it with a gun, which is a controller just. Yeah, this is actually very interesting. Uh, I, I know their team, uh, they are quite actually interesting. They, it's actually an esports game. Uh, that they, mm -hmm. they they make it as a like a location for location based VR, and it's uh, the Tower Tech team is really doing a good job. As far as I know, now it becomes part of Steam, uh, so you can even play uh, now uh, through Steam. So yeah, it's a very interesting technique. Uh, Kyle, uh, Kyle is uh, from uh, our advisory board as well, and uh, he will be with us, I guess, tomorrow. So, uh, but happy to hear your question. I think you have one question here. Yeah, I guess I'll shoot for the question today and then we can chat about it more tomorrow. Again, I don't want to take up a ton of time, but I, the, one of the big questions that I've been having is, yeah, well, first off, Mar and the rest of the group, thank you guys so much for this. It's, been, it's amazing that y'all put this together. It's uh, um, like a dream come true from, from our perspective. Um, but we, I, I wonder if there's going to be a point in time where we start taking you know, a top set of those ones just like you were mentioning to allow people to select things within games to so build the package. And then ultimately it's easier for developers to pull these in versus, you know, they're all individual packages um, and almost like a, a, a set instance where you, you programmatically, you just, you pull those particular components in. Uh, are those things that are being worked on right now, or ultimately is there like a, a subgroup that could be created to try to create those packages for Unreal and Unity? Um. I mean, what we're doing for now, at least on, on our side, is trying to have maximal support for the maximal tools. Uh, but uh, it's me and Eyal. <laughs> so we're yeah. getting a lot of support from other people. Uh, universities that are using our tools for, you know, they, they are building this thing and then coming and saying, hey, you know, we have this thing working now uh, in Unreal. Okay, give it to us. We do a bit of code review, ways to... Uh, one thing that I want to have is a bit of a YouTube channel, which each of the things, how do you actually import it, right? Because you don't know the, the GitHub and sometimes you don't know how to do things. But certainly the collaboration is open for anyone who wants to transfer any of our tools for anything else or say, hey, now I have it working with this or... We have probably a space for you guys on the contribution to anyone here. Yeah, awesome. that's what I appreciate that. 
I mean, yeah. this is something that we can do, like whatever it, it can, especially uh, researcher part. Anyways, IEEE and ACM SIGGRAPH community is already doing a good job. But from the industry side, especially from, because every uh, quarter uh, we have different crazy experiments coming from our uh, classes. So we can even bring that uh, to your uh, maybe advice and uh, you can give feedback. I think it would be great to, to share this knowledge as much as we yeah, can. Yeah, I'm happy to, to interact more further and uh, keep this active. I think we need to have a stronger community on on these three areas that I showed, right? Like the avatars, the locomotion and the, the haptics. And I understand the haptics is the trickiest one because building actual prototypes is uh, far beyond software, right? Yeah. Uh, but, mm -hmm. So, uh, Absolutely. appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I will. Um, and Nicolas has one question. Maybe we can talk about that. Uh, 3D Rudder is also one of our uh, oldest actually partners. Um, so, have you have you get the chance to try 3D Rudder uh, for the especially direction or? So we were not able to really try it. As I say, this is one of the handicaps of our tool. And some of our collaborators were already saying, hey, you don't describe Bexion correctly for this one. It's like, maybe we couldn't try it, right? We didn't try it. But uh, we have tried similar tools and that's where we're, you know, it is, we are aware that our database might have uh, some things missing. And I think actually the haptic devices that are, I mean, have the, the the hardware devices that are uh, particular, particularly solving some of these things, are pretty good, yeah. <laughs> right? Like the router is a good solution. You know, these these things become a good solution. It's harder to adopt because you need to buy it, or yeah. or find one, or you know, sometimes it's not so easy. Uh, but uh, they generally propose an interesting solution for the problem. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I'm pretty sure that they, they can send uh, for people who wants to explore for research purposes. So mm -hmm. uh, happy to, to meet you as well. So uh, I would like to actually, uh, maybe to our panelists, anyone who would like to ask questions because we have to wrap up maybe in the next five minutes. Yeah, I need to yeah. order lunch for a three-year-old. Yeah, uh, it's almost okay. 12. So let's let's. <laughs> Let's wrap it up uh, very quickly. First of all, um, like anyone has any last minute question? If not, we will continue the discussion uh, tomorrow at Clubhouse. Uh, maybe our team can share the uh, Clubhouse invite details. Um, for those who wants to continue the discussion today, at least internally, join our Discord uh, discussion after party. Um, we will start in 15 minutes. So anyone, I think I'm seeing Massimiliano here and uh, other people. So anyone who wants to say um, maybe last words or uh, anything to add before we finish. By the way, we also have the poll results, uh, AI applications for VR. Maybe we can ask from Microsoft research team who will bring maybe a few uh, interesting uh, guest speakers for AI applications for VR. It is not easy to find this uh, for this subject. So, okay, great. So I think uh, we, we are now good to go for at least for today. Thank you, Mar, for, for like, I mean, for today you spent uh, a lot of time, but uh, I'm seeing that you have already spent a lot of time, not only for your own research and creating uh, amazing uh, uh, inspiration to the world, but also bringing people together. I think we need more, more initiators uh, to make this happen because now we can see things together. You know, like um, I feel like sometimes like um, since big companies are have to do the IP protection, etc., that things are happening behind the doors. So you are a little bit giving us a glimpse of this uh, research happening, whatever happening in, behind the doors. So thank you for, for this, first of all. Um, and uh, if you have anything to share, like for IEEE VR or any, 
anything to, that you would like to invite people? I will reach with the updates of how we're, our initiatives are moving and all of that. I'm uh, in contact and, you know, also on Twitter, people can find me and ask me questions. I'm quite responsive there. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. And thank uh, you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And uh, happy to see you tomorrow as well. Have a very nice day and evening.